Today on a special two-episode series of The Grave Talks, Inside the Overbrook Insane Asylum, a conversation with Ronald Koval. Ronald is the man who almost wasn't. At a very young age, he nearly died of suffocation, was declared dead, but miraculously came back to life and to live a very intriguing life. On his journey, he'd be drawn to work inside the famed Overbrook Insane Asylum during its operational years. He worked from 1988 to 1998. During his time there, he would experience countless shocking, haunting, and paranormal experiences that simply cannot be explained. From time warps to conversation to the patients who have already passed and much, much more. This is his story spread throughout two episodes of The Grave Talks. Well, it started when I was very young, when I was about, uh, oh my God, like five years old. Um, an incident happened, but I didn't learn about the incident until I was about a little over 17. When I first got my uh, driving permit, mm -hmm. a, fam a family friend of my mother's called up one time and was talking with my mother. Her and her husband were being transferred from New Jersey to Florida for his job. And my mother wanted me to drive her to her house to visit with her. Mm -hmm. I said, sure, you know, I didn't have a license yet, but a learner's permit, and I was more than happy to drive. Sure. So we went for the ride, I took her there and got to the house. And when we went inside, I kind of recognized these people a little bit. I haven't seen them in years. And then my wife, my, my, my wife, my mother was talking with the one lady, the gentleman's wife there, and uh, they had coffee. And he said, well, you want, you want coffee, whatever, we'll sit in the living room. I said, sure. As we went into the living room, sat down and drank the coffee, he said to me, he said, did your mother ever tell you about the time I saved your life? I said, excuse me? He said, you know, the time I saved your life? I said, no. So now I'm 17. He gets up from his chair, goes in the kitchen, and asks my mother if it's okay if he could tell me the story. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, yeah, he's old enough now. You know, so I still have no idea what he's talking about. Sure. So he came back in, sat down, and he looks at me, and he said to me, you were five years old at the time, you know, you were getting ready to go to start school in kindergarten. Your mother took you and your younger brother down to the barbershop, you know, get your hair cut. And we went down there and those days they gave you a lollipop and a balloon or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and we got home. And uh, of course, I'm, you know, I have the lollipop in my mouth. And as we got home, I'm sitting there and, um, uh, my mother was in the kitchen, as I recall back then. And uh, what happened was, I guess I lost consciousness. My mother found me on the floor. I was turning blue. The lollipop had broken off from the stem and lodged in my throat. Mm. My mother is not a good one for dramatic things like that. She went to get the neighbor. When she went there, I was lucky enough, the gentleman that was telling me this was home with his wife. He came over, got a hold of me, looked at my throat. He couldn't reach it. So he went into the kitchen. This is what he's telling me. Yeah. Took a small spoon and bent the end of it a little bit, wet it, held me upside down, and reached back slowly and popped it out. At the same time, they were calling an ambulance back then. Mm -hmm. And when they got there, he was trying to revive me. The ambulance pulled up. Then I guess the paramedics came in along with the police and uh, they looked at me and they told the guy to stop, you know, and he said, uh, he said, he's gone. Just stop, you know? Yeah. And he did he asked him for the oxygen and they said, no, there's no use with the oxygen. He said, then he got a little aggressive <laughs> verbally and then they gave him the oxygen and the police told him to give it to him mm -hmm. and it can't hurt nothing. So they put the oxygen mask on me, and that was about it. They lift me up and would take me outside and into the ambulance. As they were taking me out, he told me that 
the gentleman was starting to take the sheet or the blanket and put it over my head. Oh my God. And they got to a brawl over that because my mother was next door. And he says, for God's sakes, his mother's next door. He don't want to shoot. Don't want to see this. Yeah. You know. And so they took me out in the ambulance. And of course, my mother and the lady next door and them, they followed the gentleman who was with me, stayed with me for the ambulance ride. And we're going there. Now we're getting closer to the hospital, as he's telling me. And the next thing they said was, um, they get on the little radio and he says, we have a five-year-old coming in as a DOA, you know. And uh, as we're turning towards, he said, the hospital, next thing he know, he heard this um, strange gas come out of me and boom, I sat up like a bullet and grabbed his leg. And he said he almost flew to the roof of the ambulance. And he said, next thing you know, I'm looking back and forth and everything. They rushed me in. The guy got on the microphone and told him, cancel the DOA. They got me in there, checked me out and everything. Just then my mother arrived with the police and everything. And they were going to head to the morgue. And he stopped them and said, no, he's over in the corner over here. So after that, to make a very long story short, I stayed overnight for observation and was released the next day. They said the reason that I made it is called the oxygen mask that was on me was still feeding oxygen into my system. Mm-hmm. So there was never a loss of oxygen. Yeah. But my heart rate was very low and where you couldn't even hardly hear it. Yeah. And so what happened after that, as things changed, as I went into school and things started happening, um, for example, a short little example, oh my God, I think it was even in second grade or whatever, I can't recall back when exactly. But we had a, in the class, we had a contest where the girls would draw a picture of a doll or whatever, and the boys would draw a car. And the teacher would grade it over the weekend. Now, I drew the car, whatever, and they drew the doll. And I came back on Monday, when I came back in, I noticed on the desk, there was he made like little trophies for the best ones and i noticed on his little trophy was a drawing of my car cut out and taped or whatever onto this trophy yeah and he came up to me and he asked me where did you learn about this because i was a young child and and i told him i said what are you talking about he said yeah he said he talked to the science teacher and he wanted to know he said because this thing is aerodynamic where it was like a vet back then Mm -hmm. very sleek and designed with the tail in the back and everything i said i have no idea it just came to me i just and then things other things started to occur we just got a uh my god back then a new tv and it was an old one of those 14 uh 14 inch black and white tv with the antenna Mm -hmm. which you know which would with a remote control which i was the remote control Uh uh-huh and uh so my neighbor came in, friend of mine, you know, we're going to go to school, and I'm showing him this thing, the TV, new TV, and uh, he said to me, oh, that's nice. I told him, I said, you know, one day they're going to have TVs that are going to be on the wall like a picture. Well, you could just talk to them and they'll come on. Yeah. You know, and he goes, oh, get out, you know, get out of here, you know. But at that time, we used to hang around a, a church in Newark and play around there. And uh, the same church I used to go to. And the one pastor of the church was friends with him and his family. I really didn't know him that well. Mm -hmm. Uh, One day we're out there playing. The pastor came out, talked to my friend. And he asked him, he said, who is this? He goes, oh, this is Ron. He goes, oh, this is the one you're talking about? He said, yeah. He pulled me to the side along with another priest and talked to me. He says, where he was a very strong Italian accent. Where are you getting these ideas from? Is somebody telling you these things about TVs and different things I might have mentioned in that? And I said, no, they just come to me. And then he started to throw in the uh, the holy stuff. He said that this is the devil's work. That's put this in your head. Yeah. There is never going to be no TVs on the wall. <laughs> it's you know, interesting where people go. Is that like 
how is that the devil's work? I mean, you're just talking about like this is, might happen someday, you know? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, and it's so. You know, growing up as a kid, you you were told to, uh, you know, with a priest, let alone the past, the minute, whatever, yeah. you post respect them and everything else like that. You don't argue, you know. Yeah, that was it. That was that was law. So yes. I said, Oop, okay, you know, I'm yeah. gonna go to hell, you know. So as the when things went on, I kind of felt things, knew things were gonna happen. Kind of knew it when certain things happened, like even when. Uh, People were passing away. I knew when to call or what was going to go on, and but kept it to myself. Learn to control it and pull it in, you know. So following what I was told. Yeah. And uh, for years this went on, and uh, so what happened was, like, long story short, I, me and friends of mine who all got out of the military close at the same time all hanging around and one day we're sitting in the restaurant we're hanging out and i said to him you know we all got to get a job man you know we got to do something because we're turning into bums you know sure. so everybody half went to air conditioning went to this and that type of job me i went into a uh, barber i want to be a barber or a hairdresser so i was told that a hairdresser is equivalent to a barber you learn everything you know mm-hmm. so i went to school there and uh did that and uh, graduated from there, you know, and I even met my wife there. And uh, so we went back, uh, we, moved, we got married, moved back and forth to Arizona, then back to New Jersey. You know, of course, mm-hmm. that's in the family. To make sure. a long story short, I, we're, we're, living, we're living in Arizona, we were leaving it, and we went back to New Jersey, I got a job, right away in J.C. Penney's hair salon in New Jersey. And I heard of openings at Overbrook Asylum. You know, I knew Overbrook existed for a long time. Everybody did in that area. Yeah. And uh, so I was told about it by a customer who came in who worked there for a lot of years. And they said, yes, they're looking for a male attendance. I said, that's not too bad. And I said, what does the job require? And they said, you know, you, you're assigned like five patients to take care of and that and everything. And I said, what are the hours? She says, from seven to three, you get paid lunch and everything. I said, wow, that's not too bad, you know. So I said, well, let me go and fill out an application. I went, I filled out an application. Mm-hmm. And the one doctor I talked with there, he said to me, he goes, why would you want to have a job working here when you can have a job what you're doing now? This is a massive difference. Yeah. I said, well, if I can help somebody. And I said, uh, and he just handed me a piece of paper. He said, write down here in one sentence why you want to be here and what would bring you here. Yeah. And I just wrote down. I said, we're our brother's keeper. And he looked up at me and he said, you're hired. Wow. And that was it. And he said, come back in a week or so. We're starting classes. You have Mm -hmm. to go for training. Yeah. Came back. I didn't leave my other job. I I took a a leave of absence. Mm -hmm. Went there. Okay, something (laughs) didn't work out. I had my back. Sure, sure. I got there and it was... uh, we really didn't get involved with patients right then. You just run directly right to classes, mm-hmm. you know, on how to deal with different patients, psychiatric patients, and what to expect and the possibilities of danger and whatever, and how to work as a team and everything to protect yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. And it lasted for two weeks, and we got through there. Now you're like on a 90-day probation period. Mm-hmm. Where if they didn't like you whatsoever, they can just, you're gone. You know? Sure. So I went in there and uh, I went to Ward 55. I remember the gentleman led me in there. And he gives me the keys. He goes, here, you could have the honor. I got my own keys, but he handed them to me. He goes, here, you can have the honor of opening the ward if, you know, for the first time. So I get the key out, put the key in the door. And as soon as I touch that damn handle, 
a chill went right through my whole body. Wow. I felt there was something not right here. You know, mm -hmm. something's not right. But I opened the door, walked in, and it was like a whole different experience. You had patients, well, they weren't right there at this time. This is really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, it's just about not even seven o'clock yet. And we're in there, met the nurse. She told me, all I want you to do, Ron, is for two weeks, follow this gentleman here. You know, I don't want to use a lot of names. Follow him and just do what he does and that. And then after that, you're on your own. I said, okay, no problem. He took me to the back of the ward. And back there at the time, they were giving the patient showers and, and digging out clothes from donations. And to my shock, I'm looking there. And half these patients are not even really in the shower. Mm -hmm. They're not even wet. <laughs> the clothes they were picking out were donation clothes. I mean, when put it together, they look like transients. Mm -hmm. They really look bad. Yeah. I, I felt bad for them. I really did. My heart went out to them. And uh, so I followed them for a while. And uh, about a couple of days later, the, they gave me the clipboard. They said, okay, take a head count. And tell me how many come up with and stuff to see who's missing, whatever. And then they have to bother to name, just take a count. And I came back with a count and the count was more than what we had there. And they kept on saying, you kept, you counted somebody twice, you know. Mm -hmm. And now they're all sitting in the day room. It's kind of hard to miss them. <laughs> sure. You know. And so I went back again, and I went, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and boom, I come up with more people that are there. And they said, no, I'll do it. Don't worry about it. You know. Mm -hmm. So what happened was then after that, then came an inspection came in for them to get their certification. And I went to the head nurse and she said to me there, she said, uh, Ron, what do you think about everything? Because they came in. It was like a thing you see in reform school. They came in, they bought in new clothing for them, like dungaree clothing. Mm -hmm. They replaced the broken furniture. They bought in games. The place was extremely spotless, you know. Yeah. And that, and when the nurse asked me, she says, well, you're new here. What do you think? I says, well, they look okay. Everything is nice, but the patients look like crap. Yeah. She says, what do you mean? I told her I have a license. I have a lot of equipment. If you want to, I'll come in and I'll clean them up. You know, yeah. if I get help from the other attendants. She agreed. She said, I can't ask you, but if you're willing to, you know, give your services, we'll accept it. Mm-hmm. Came in the following day with all my equipment. The attendants helped out. We cleaned it. We had 20-something patients on that ward. We got them all, you know, and got them all, cleaned them up, went in the, through the inspection and that, and we passed it. And in the memorandum that went around saying that uh, everybody did good, the wards were nice, but they wanted to know how come Ward 55, the patients were all cleaned up and their hair was cut and they looked really good, and the rest didn't. Mm-hmm. And, and that's when things started changing. I got it pulled in from the hair salon to pull down there to work on all the male wards and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got to mingle throughout the whole hospital. And one of the first incidents I had that was totally out of the norm is that I went into work one morning. I'm like a creature of habit. I don't like to go to work and hang just go in and start working. Sure. I got to kind of get get adjusted. So I walked in that morning and I stopped off, got my coffee and then I came inside and there was a patient standing there in the middle of the ward. Now this is ward 13 and it's empty. It's an empty ward. It's only shared by me and a little bit of housekeeping that's away in the back. And uh, I asked them, and we're going to use a different name just for the sake of it. I said to him, I said, Anthony, I said, what are you doing here? And how do you get on this side of the ward? And the first thing out of his mouth was, he goes, Ron, do you have a cigarette? I said, sure, because I bought cigarettes, occasionally smoke, but that was basically to hand out the patients who didn't have anything. Yeah. And uh, I told him, I said, well, let me put my coffee in my room and that we have to go onto the porch and smoke. So his ward is next door, so there's no problem. So 
we walked out on the porch. I had him a cigarette, I lit it for him, I lit one, and we were talking. Now, this guy grew up in the same area that I lived at years ago. We knew the same church, everything else, and we were just chit-chatting about that, you know. Sure. And then I happened to look at my watch, I looked down, I said, my God, it's like almost five up, you know. And we were talking since about close to a little six, what, almost 630 or whatever around here when I came in, because I was coming very early. And I said, I have to go punch in, Anthony. I said, listen, I said, I had your cigarette and come on, let's go. So as I took my cigarette onto the porch, which is all cement, I reached down to die it out. And as I'm as I look up with the keys in my hand, this mass is like right in front of me and just moves right through me. At the same time, I felt as somebody had a vice inside my chest and was grabbing my heart and squeezing it. I went down on my knees and to the floor. And that was it. I was down there just trying to breathe. Yeah. I couldn't even breathe. And I was scared. You know, I can't, don't want to swear. <laughs> but you can swear. Even the jury, I'll control myself. But it was like that. And that old saying that your life passed by you, that's bull. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're just trying to hang in there. And next thing I know, slowly but surely, I started to breathe. And I could feel it coming back. And I reached over, kind of crawled over to the railing on the porch, pulled myself up. My head hanging down, my hands are shaking, my chest still feels achy. I look over at Anthony, see what he's doing, and he's gone. Anthony is now gone. I look down, and the cigarette's still on the ground. So just at an instinct, I just died out his cigarette, and I'm looking on the porch now. We're on the hilltop, they call it, and you got a view of everything below you, and he's not there. So I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, well, maybe Anthony went for help. Yeah. I walked into the ward, got my key, walked in, because in that ward there, which is next to us, they had the time clock in the nurse's station across the ward, they give out the meds. So I walked in there, I hit my time clock in, just about seven. I'm sitting in the chair there. The nurse walks in and she says, Ron, what happened? You okay? You look like crap. I said, I just asked her for Tylenol or whatever, because I have a massive headache. Mm -hmm. And she said, sure. So she gave me a couple of pills and some water. And um, just then, an attendant came running down because the dorms were upstairs. So he came running down and he says to her, we have a patient down. You have to call a cold blue. Mm -hmm. So they call in a cold blue and she calls the doctor. And she says to me, how are you feeling? Any better? I said, yeah, I'm OK. You know, I feel better. And she said, can you come up and help us? Because we're short of staff. Because mm -hmm. I was once an attendant. So, I, you know, I, they pulled me up there. Sure. So I said, sure, no problem. So I go up the staircase or up there with the rest of them. And what we're trying to do is gather these patients together and bring them downstairs into the day room so they don't experience this stuff, you know. Sure. You know, so what happened was when we got them down there, we made sure their door because there were about five to six dorms up there. And as we got them out, we locked the door behind them so they can't get back in because they like to go through other people's things. Mm -hmm. Long story short, they go down and now it's clear. Now the doctor and the nurse are in the one room with the one patient. So I went over, I opened the door. I said, listen, I'm going now. I have to go back to work. And the doctor comes up to me and goes, run. I need your help. I need you to do me a favor. I said, what's that, Doc? He said, you have to sign this sheet. We need another witness. We have to cover ourselves. You know, I said, sure, give me it. I'll sign it. You know, So I'm looking at it and it has the signature right there as witness. So I signed my name. And right above it, it says, time of death estimated 6.30 a.m. You know, I said, mm -hmm. okay, here you go, Doc. And I hand him the clipboard and not even thinking. I turn around and walk away. He says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Ron. <laughs> yeah. You got to see the body. You know, sure. I turn around and I had to step around the bed and now where the bed was right behind me and laying on the floor is a body there where he has a sheet covering it, except for the legs and the legs were like swollen, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, OK, I said, let's see what we you know what it is. And uh, he took the sheet instead of slowly bringing it over. He just kind of flings it right off, you know, and as I looked down there I see is Anthony lying on the floor. 
His tongue is bitten between his teeth like it's almost off. Mm -hmm. His eyes are bulging out. His hands are clutched to his chest. Like he's frozen like that. And I just went right to the bed. My, I lost my knees, just gave way. I just went to the bed and put down. He covered the body back up. And the doctor, I just remember, he says, we put your head down, just breathe slow, breathe slow, you know. Mm-hmm. And that he said, they shouldn't have done that. The shock of seeing the body. I said, Doc, I said, that's not it. I just had a cigarette with this man a few minutes ago. He yeah. said, don't, don't worry about it. Right. Yeah. He figured I didn't know what I was talking about. So I got myself composed. I got up. And as I turned and looked, they have their own little dresser things where they keep their clothes at. And this opens up. And as I turned and looked, I see hanging up is the exact same clothes that he was wearing downstairs. Oh, wow. And that was it for me. So <laughs> I got out of there, went downstairs, and lucky enough, I was caught up with most of my work. And when I called my supervisor, they told me, well, just stay in your room, relax for a while. You know, mm-hmm. you, you went through a lot. You know, And because uh, I just told him about the patient upstairs. I didn't tell him about the porch. Yeah. You know, you don't go around saying those things in a, in a psychiatric hospital. Sure, now. yeah. Otherwise, they're going to think you should be in the psychiatric hospital. You got it. So I just told him about that, and I relaxed. And then I called up the priest I knew, you know, was friends with, and uh, set up a time to talk with him. And instead of him waiting, because he heard the distress of my voice, he came up. You know, I met him in the parking lot. Sure. You know, and uh, we talked out there. We strolled around. It was a warm day. And I told him, and I said to him, what happened exactly? He said, Ron, he goes, what do you experience there? He said, it's like the angel of death. He said, it just came by to collect Anthony. You know, and the thing about it is that he knew Anthony's family. He knew the family. And that, and, uh, so that was like one incident, and that was enough to scare the hell out of me for there, you know. What was uh, so and, after uh, you had this incident, uh, you know, and and you you clearly you thought nothing of having a cigarette with this guy. You didn't think he was dead. You didn't think it was a ghost. He was there as plain as day, a- except then he was gone very quickly. But you know, logical reasoning still playing a part of. Well, maybe he went this way or that way, and I just didn't catch it. And then you see that. I mean, I, I know you, you broke down and, and you needed to take some time for yourself. How are, are you or how were you or how was your mind kind of putting those pieces of the puzzle together at that moment? At that moment, then, i tell you the God's honest truth. I wasn't trying to put the pieces together. Uh-huh. At that time, I was still scared. W- were you I afraid? Still, you know, what, 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 about the whole what, thing. What were you scared of? Dying. Okay. You come that close to the like the end. That's what I thought I was doing. I was dying. Okay. When you come that close, and now I have a wife, I have kids, and I'm just like, it's over. Yeah. You know, and that, like I said, the hospital itself, the asylum holes, as I went on further working there, coming into different occurrences that happen, it holds a lot more in there. There's things I've seen, like there's even an example of one, when uh, one time when I was home, I received a phone call from my brother and uh, and he said to me, he says, Ron, he goes, you better sit down. He said, uh, you know, mom passed away and I said what are you talking about then this is bad for me because it was Mother's Day day, a few days after Mother's Day Mm -hmm. on May 11th right and it happened to be my birthday is May 9th so Mm -hmm. this is like a shock that every Mother's Day I got to relive this so I asked him what happened and then what's going on and he says well the family's gonna get together at the house tomorrow and he said he went to the house, go in, and he had his key, but the chain was on the door. There was no answer. Mm-hmm. So he had to call the police, and the police came there, and they says, okay, if we break the chain, he says, sure, go ahead. And they broke it, and they walked in, they checked, and they found her 
apparently she passed away in her sleep, mm-hmm. you know, and that. And so I got a few days off and uh, then eventually went back to work. Now, this is the part where I'm thinking I'm going back to work. I got to readjust myself a little bit. So I figured it's been an easy day. I'm only working on the ward next door to me and I'm familiar with all the patients there. So it's going to be an easy day. So the one patient, the last one I did, he's sitting there and I'm trimming him up his hair a little bit and that keep these people looking good. And uh, he came out of nowhere, out of the blue and said to me, I'm sorry to hear about your mother passing. (laughs) And now I'm wondering, I said, well, how would you know? I said to him, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know? Yeah. And that, and it was then the shocking part, he turned to me and he said to me, he goes, well, at least she went in her sleep. It was peaceful. I said, how the hell do you know that? You know? Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, he pointed to the chair in front of him and said, right there, they said it. He said, I said, who the hell is they? He said, he looked at me and serious with it with an odd voice. He put it right there and when he said that i looked and at that time whatever the hell was there got up and came right past me knocked me right on my ass oh my gosh and i'm lying there i'm getting up and i'm going son of a you know yeah you can swear don't worry so yeah my head's like blowing up i'm going because i can't put my hands around it i can't figure it out sure and that so i got my stuff together and I told him, take it easy. I gave him a cigarette. Thanks for getting about my mother. I appreciate it. You know, because it's not his fault. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I go back into my room, their office I had, and I'm sitting there for a while, shaking my head. It's what the hell is going on in this damn place? You know? And then things even progress even more. It doesn't get any better. None of it does. That's going to wrap up part one of episode one of our conversation about the Overbrook Insane Asylum. To hear the extras, be sure to become a gravekeeper. We're going to talk about Ron and if he believes his near-death experience as a child made him sensitive to the dead. What's happening in physical reality when people experience something that can only be described as a time warp, which he experienced. And are we the ghosts in those settings? Do the spirits who suffered and froze to death at the Overlook at the turn of the century have a message to give Ron? Until next time, for all of us at the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 